This is uh, Galatians 3, uh, the Wednesday morning um, Bible study for May 26th, 2021. Father, thank you for bringing us again to, together, and we ask that you be with us as we Consider your word, study it, lift you up, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will begin, uh, uh, actually I had covered a, uh, uh, two or three slides before, but we're going to begin with Galatians chapter 2. Then after an interval of 14 years, I, Paul, went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them, that is to the people in Jerusalem, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation, the leaders in the church, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now that is the issue that is being brought before the Jerusalem conference. And it had to do with what if a Gentile wanted to come to Christ, did he first have to come to Judaism? Now, uh, this is something that uh, forms a big part of the burden of Galatians. But it was because of the false brethren, this is the reason we went to the church in Jerusalem, secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that truth, the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Now this suggests, it doesn't exactly say so, that there were some present who wanted Titus to be circumcised because Titus is a Gentile. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that is, the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, or the Jews. For he... And uh, the notes that are most likely either talking about God the Father or the Holy Spirit. For he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. Now, this says that uh, Paul is as much a, uh, an apostle as Peter. Was. And that has also been a bone of contention because some of these people who were, were what we call Judaizers contended that Paul was not really an apostle because he did not participate in the earthly ministry of Christ. And Paul contends that he was an apostle and here he says, uh, look, if Peter was an apostle, I'm an apostle as well. And recognizing the grace 
Just a note that uh, charis, grace, normally uh, is, is, transla is interpreted as meaning unmerited favor or gift is sometimes used by Paul to indicate empowerment. Now, Paul seems to have generated this new meaning for uh, charis in one sense, in that it was not only was it the grace that leads to salvation, but another meaning can be that this is provides the empowerment to accomplish something that the Holy Spirit or, or Jesus wish to accomplish. <coughs> the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, James, Peter and John, who were reputed to be pillars in the church, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only ask us, uh, Paul, Barnabas, and me, to remember the poor, the poor in Judea. Remember that those left in Judea, the Jews who had come to Christ and were now Christians, suffered tremendous persecution. They were often disowned by their family. They lost their jobs. They lost their property and were in uh, dire straits. They only asked me to, us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Prior to the coming of certain men from James, and those men, those Jews who came from James, probably was only a false rumor that they came from James, and it's not likely that James and Jerusalem actually sent them. Well, prior to the coming of certain men from James, probably a false rumor, he used, used to eat with the Gentiles. But when those men came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, the Jews, who allegedly had come from Jerusalem at the behest of James. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Jews. In other words, you've been eating like a Gentile, not conforming to the dietary laws imposed upon the Jews. Uh, why are you compelling the Gentiles to follow those dietary laws? We are Jews by nature, you, Peter, and me. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews considered all Gentiles to be sinners. And this is an incidental uh, passage from Luke 18. For he, Jesus, will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. You see, the Jews blamed the, uh, uh, the crucifixion on the Gentiles, and the Gentiles, meanwhile, called, uh, <laughs> called the Jews 
Christ killers. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified, remember the, the definition of justified is that God the Father has legally declared those people just or righteous and therefore capable of entering into eternal life and living forever with the Godhead. They're not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And he's talking about here the law of Moses. But if, while we are seeking to be justified in Christ rather than the law, we have been found or declared to be sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. And there's a, a passage from Romans chapter 6. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. There are many uh, accounts of people being raised temporarily from death, but they would ultimately die once again. But Christ when he was raised from the death, that his resurrection would never die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And he's addressing this to Gentile Christians. For if I, I rebuild, I, Paul, rebuild what I once destroyed. Remember, I used to imprison and even kill the, the Christians. I proved myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Now the point is this. When Peter lives like a Gentile, he tears down the ceremonial law and Paul certainly approves of that. But when Peter then falls back and lives like a Jew because he was afraid of those Jews who came from Jerusalem, he tears down the gospel of grace. And for that he is condemned. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Actually, as we now know, that Christ lives in heaven on the throne of God, but Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who gave me as I became born again or born from above and now live in Christ the, that is imparted by the Holy Spirit who entered into me to indwell me. By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If the law of Moses 
was capable of achieving salvation, there would have been no need for Christ to go to the trouble to come into this world as a, not only as the Son of God, but as a human being and die on a cross for the dealing with sin. Here I show you another habit of mine, and that is when I depart from this, uh, strictly speaking, the, the text and introduce uh, something as uh, an aside, I will change the color of the slide. So here, you see, we've done that, and uh, uh, this slide is in yellow. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Now, this is a single verse out of Proverbs. It can easily be overlooked or underappreciated but you understand what it is saying. It sounds perfectly reasonable. Someone who justifies the wicked would certainly be an abomination, and someone who condemns the righteous would certainly be an abomination. And the Lord has done both of these. He has overlooked for a time the sins of the sinners, the wicked, and he has certainly condemned Christ by making him to be sin and then uh, killing him spiritually on the cross. Now, according to this, uh, this is my note, God cannot justify the unrighteous if he did, he would be unjust and an abomination to himself. He must pour out his wrath on the unrighteous. This is the strict interpretation of this passage in Proverbs. Jesus, according to Romans chapter 3, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, a hilasterion, which has the meaning of satisfaction, and Jesus was displayed by God as a satisfactory substitute or sacrifice for sin, as also uh, translated in, in the letter to the Hebrews as the mercy seat, the lid on the, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant, which came between the Holy God and the, uh, and, and the Ten Commandments contained in the Ark of the Covenant. So Jesus, who God displayed public as a propitiation in his blood through faith, that is his death on the cross, this is, was to demonstrate his righteousness, that is God's righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. So in this sense, and in this way, Jesus was the vindication of both the justness and the ability to, uh, at the same time, be a justifier of the wicked. Well, the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus.
The note is that God would be unjust if he passed over sins, but in this way he is shown to be able to justify the sinner while remaining just by dealing with sin on the, in the blood of Christ on the cross. And we're now, uh, we actually are through with chapter 2 of uh, Galatians. And we're going to finish with a passage from Isaiah 53. Uh, Isaiah 53 is uh, uh, the the chapter in Isaiah that the Jews almost uniformly refuse to read because it is a conviction it can lead to the conviction that Jesus was in fact the Messiah we read in Isaiah 53 verse 10 but the Lord was pleased to crush him, that is, Jesus, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, which he agreed to do, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. As a result of the anguish of his soul, Jesus' soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, one of the servant passages in Isaiah, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Christ bore their iniquities, having been made sin, for his death on the cross. His death on the cross thus led to the doing away with the punishment for sin. Therefore, he says, I will allot him a portion with the great because he has done that. And he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, having been made sin by God. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Let's stop there and we will start next time with chapter 3 of Galatians. Thank you, Father, for this glorious truth that you have put before us that Jesus vindicated you he agreed to become sin so that by his death on the cross he could put to death all of sin. Thank you so much. And we ask now that you go with us for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.